Well, hey, everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to today's podcast. Um, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, not something that we're uh, well versed on here in the United States, but it's uh, it causes quite a bit of problems in certain parts of the world. And, and I'm, I think it's important to go, have, go ahead and go over this um, viral disease. Uh, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever is one of the several priority diseases listed by the World Health Organization that pose the greatest public health risk due to their epidemic potential and or whether there is no or insufficient countermeasures. Well, today, one of the reasons I was interested in talking about this is what's going on in Iraq right now. We've got a pretty significant outbreak in Iraq, and the latest numbers that I saw is been 142 cases and 24 fatalities uh, since the beginning of the year. So what is Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever? Well, joining me today uh, for a primer on Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever is Shandana Bala. Chandi is the president of Global Insight Advisory Network and writes on the intersection of healthcare and technology. She is also a frequent, excuse me, frequent writer for Gideon Informatics, and uh, you ought to check that out. I can link to that. She does a lot of great blog posts there. And she's joining me today from India. Hi, Chandy, and welcome back to the program. Hi, Robert. Thank you so much for having me. You bet. All right, well, let, let's go ahead and start with a little background on the history. And then after some history, go ahead and jump into the geography. You know, where is it found? Sure. So Crimean Congo, Crimean Crimean, however you pronounce it, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever is, you know, it can be a mouthful. So it's mostly called CCHF. That's right. And it's a tick-borne virus. And it, it gets its name because in 1944, there was, it was first characterized in Crimea in 1944. And the Congo part comes in because there was a big outbreak in 1969, which caused severe illness and, you know, you know, uh, was resulted in the deaths of many. And so that these two notable outbreaks kind of is where the name came from. That's kind of the history of uh, the name. And geography wise, uh, it's since it's a tick-borne virus, the ticks kind of like warmer weathers. So Eastern Europe, Southwestern Europe, Africa, Asia, and the Middle East are mostly the regions endemic for this virus. Exactly. And this is the, the map from the CDC that they offer. And you can see that it's primarily Eastern Europe, the Middle East. It goes as far east as parts of uh, Russia, Pakistan, even parts of India. Uh, and of course, it's peppered all over the African continent. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, now, we're seeing a lot of cases in, in Iraq uh, today. Um, but normally, year to year, uh, what countries see the most CCHF? So normally, the highest... So far, the highest cases, number of lab confirmed cases are in Turkey. And, you know, bear in mind, it could be because that country decided to invest in lab services and testing and finding this disease early. So just, you know, doesn't mean they have the highest cases. Um, and Iraq, like you mentioned, is extremely interesting because I think you mentioned 150 and I just checked today. I think it's almost 200 cases oh, wow. and 97% have been verified, uh, lab confirmed. Uh, so I think who is still uh, tracking that and hopefully the cases, the outbreak can come down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how is it transmitted to humans and are there individuals at more risk of this disease than others? Yeah, uh, so some of the individuals at a bigger risk are people who work with livestock or are butchers. Healthcare workers are also at a higher risk of getting infected. So there are, so it's a, since it's a tick-borne virus, there are two ways in which humans can get it from a tick. So either a tick bites you directly and you get infected or a tick bites an animal and then the animal is asymptomatic but can still transfer the infection to you. So animals can include sheep, cattle, goat, hamster, uh, sorry, um, hedgehogs and hares, rabbits, things like that. And mm. they, they don't have any symptoms, but they are intermediate hosts. But once a person is infected, they can transmit it to another person. So if I come in contact with some an infected person's blood 
or body fluids, I can get infected. Another way is through hospital associated infections or if um, so, someone uses medical equipment that's contaminated. But it's not considered airborne, right? It's not considered airborne. However, as you mentioned, the CDC considers it an extreme biohazard risk and it's a biosafety level four pathogen, right. mainly because air droplets, infected droplets of CCHF can be aerosolized and let loose in a public arena and you know uh, inf transmit and um, infect a bunch of people. And it's also highly fatal it has a high fatality rate of 30 to 40 percent almost and there is no effective treatment so that's that's kind of why it's categorized as level four so yeah. on its own it's not transmitted by air but unless you're very close to an infected patient or something like that yeah so 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 chandy as you mentioned it's, it's a it's a serious disease and it has hemorrhagic fever in its name so that kind of gives you a clue that it's pretty serious um what are the signs and symptoms of cchf as you mentioned, the name has hemorrhagic fever in it. So one of the early signs, sim symptoms actually can appear really quickly. So if you get bitten by a tick, the incubation period can be one to three days. If you get infected through like an HAI, it can be five to six days before uh, symptoms appear. Um, the key with symptoms with CCHF, the scary part is that even in phase one, symptoms appear suddenly. So you can get a headache, you can get high fever, dizziness, uh, nausea, vomiting. Some people experience like a fast heart rate. They even, ex uh, you can have sensitivity to light. You can have an eye infection, sore throat. You can even have uh, enlarged lymph nodes and even a big liver. Okay, so these, these are scary on its own mm -hmm. and then it just gets worse. So the second phase of the disease is where the hemorrhagic part comes in. So the second phase of the disease, as the fever progresses, you can have extensive bleeding, nosebleeds, and from in, in, uh, injection sites, from where the tick has bitten you, you can have in, incredible amount of bleeding. Uh, if, as I said before, it has a very high mortality rate. So when people die, they can die as soon as within the second week of being infected. But in people who recover, they start getting better usually around the ninth to 10th day after getting infected. Yeah, so I've done a little reading on this lately and uh, a lot of people are implicating climate change, um, higher temperatures uh, that's affecting the spread of CCHF. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, I think that's what experts are really a little scared of and keeping an eye out for CCHF and also why we need more research about this disease, this highly fatal and you know deadly disease, um, climate as temperatures rise and there's global warming, there's environmental changes, agricultural land changes, there's lower rainfall. All these factors are contributing to ticks being able to survive in regions that they weren't able to before. Right. You know, to be honest, so these ticks can travel and live in places that weren't there, that were not really habitable to them before. For example, Northern Europe is now reporting cases. For example, Sweden has cases being reported. One of the reasons why is that birds cannot get infected, but if these infected ticks can hitch a ride on a migratory bird. And as their patterns change because of climate change again, they can take these ticks to newer regions and start the disease there. Yeah, and that's and that's pretty much what's happening here in the U.S. with Lyme and, and other related tick-borne diseases. Yeah. You're starting to see that spread because of uh, warming temperatures. Um, how do they diagnose this? There's, you just can't go to a local hospital to get a diagnose, right? It's specialized testing or? Yeah, unfortunately, there is no universal gold standard or a test for CCHF. We do need more on this, but uh, for now, people use the standard RT-PCRs, cell culture, ELISA antigen tests to diagnose. One of the difficulties with CCHF, as I mentioned, it's a, it, it is a biohazard, a biosafety pathogen. So ideally people live up to very high standards of pro safety protocols of how do you handle the pathogen? How do you collect samples? How do you handle them in the lab and test them, et cetera. But in real life, CCHF is usually found in rural areas with no access to specialized labs or things like that. So 
it's unfortunately a reality we have to live with. It may not be always handled safely. Yeah, and, and like you said earlier on, it's it's a BSL-4 or biosafety level four pathogen. So there's only, even in the United States, there's only a handful of labs that could even handle something like that. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Well, so Chandy, is it is it like a, a lot of viruses that we uh, we read about and talk about? Um, it's there, but there's not any specific treatments, uh, or or is there a specific treatment for it? Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. There is no effective treatment, and that's why it is on the ext- one of the reasons why it's on a, the level. It's a level four biosafety pathogen. Uh, however, there's an antiviral called ribavirin, which is being used. And the virus has been sensitive to it, so it's being used in treatments. Excellent. Now, as far as prevention, um, you know, it's a, it's a dangerous virus. Are there, are there vaccines for people, or vaccines for animals? I know you'd think there would be, but I think <laughs> that there are no vaccines for this disease. And as yeah. I researched more, it was even scarier. Yeah. Uh, the, one of the reasons why, actually, is because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, if the ticks a lot of the animals, the intermediate hosts, are immune to the virus. So when we do vaccine research, it's usually on mice or guinea pigs or hamsters, and all of them are resistant to the virus. So that kind of hindered the process of finding vaccines for a while. Um, one of the, there has been some developments in this area. Um, in 2021, they've discovered a variant of CCHF or the identified one that can be used, that can be mouse adapted and used in mouse adapted research. Additionally, they've identified non-human primate models and some types of, you know, murine rodent models that can be used uh, for research. So hopefully we will see more in this field. But for now, I would say the best way is preventive, which is raising awareness with A, among butchers and people who work with livestock, teaching them safety precautions, making sure they wear their protective gear when they handle raw meat or animals. And for healthcare workers have to wear their PPE, they have to isolate, you know, uh, in fact, potentially infected individuals. They have to cover their face and eyes so that they don't get droplets when they're uh, respiratory, whatever droplets when they're close to a patient things like that. So I think prevention for now is, is the best treatment. Yeah. And, and, and I guess the other thing is just, you know, preventing tick bites, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if, yeah. If you can, if you can, yeah. Yeah. Wear protective gear. Yeah. 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 Um, and any final thoughts on CCHF, uh, anything that we didn't cover that you think we need to cover? Yeah. I think that, uh, one of the biggest things that's missing is education about CCHF. So there's not much awareness and not many people know about this disease. So if medical schools, public health officials, clinicians on the front lines pay more attention to CCHF, they have better resources at their fingertips, uh, they should be able to do differential diagnosis. So they see symptoms, uh, they should be able to know that, oh, it's different from another disease that also has fevers and headaches and things like that. So having some kind of tool or platform available with infectious diseases information at your fingertips would be most helpful. For example, Gideon is uh, one of the leading comprehensive databases uh, in the world for infectious diseases. And so having access to something like that can definitely help us maybe, um, you know, yeah, just, this disease. Yeah. Just one more question, Chandy. You're, you're in India and according to the CDC map, there's parts of Western India that are endemic, mm-hmm. right? Small parts, small parts yeah. of it. Is is there a, um, much news about CCHF in India, or just no? Actually, absolutely not. I did some research. I tried to Google something before this call to see what's up in my own country, and yeah, there's yeah. not much written about it. Yeah, and I actually think it's because the symptoms, early symptoms, are so generic to. Uh, a lot of things. It's nausea, vomiting, disease, yeah, yeah, dizziness. Yeah. I think it's awareness. People may not go to the hospital for these kind of symptoms. Right, because the, the early symptoms are non-specific, right? That could be yeah. a number of different things. Well, again, a very informative uh, talk, and I appreciate it. Shandana Bala, thank you for your time. and uh, Thank you so much for having me back. I really yes, love it. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.